Welcome again this week, everyone, to A Captain's Log. I'm your host, Brian Kreutz, and continuing her shore leave on an undisclosed planet in the Alpha Quadrant is the off-duty officer of all officers, my co-host, Lily Fox Lim. Hey there, BK. We're on a secure channel, not just subspace comms, right? Yes, of course, Lils. Per your explicit ask. <sighs> Good. Good. Then I can reveal my whereabouts to you and our viewers at the end of this episode. I've been scientifically researching as an undercover Vulcan here for over a week now. Thanks to our good doctor, I've been surgically altered to look like a Vulcanian. And I'm glad to be back with what I'm sure will be the highlight episode of the year for me. How have you been, Brian? Seems very empty here without your absolute candor, but it's been a relaxing week. Aha! You referenced the Picard episode, Absolute Candor, but I catch your sarcasm. It's the opposite when I'm there with you among the stars and guest stars. <laughs> <laughs> yes! That's you there. I'm sure our fans catch your candor. Speaking of fans' familiarity with you, the fans may be familiar with Tilly from Discovery, who left for a brief time to go back to the Academy. We have a tremendous headline in our Star Trek news. I can't wait to see what the future of Trek holds for us. Let's do the Trek news now. Paramount Plus announces a series order for Star Trek Starfleet Academy. Star Trek Starfleet Academy will introduce us to a young group of cadets who come together to pursue a common dream of hope and optimism under the watchful and demanding eyes of their instructors, which Brian and I strongly believe will be Lieutenant Sylvia Tilly, among others, as those instructors. And the group of cadets will discover what it takes to become Starfleet officers as they navigate blossoming friendships, explosive rivalries, first loves, and a new enemy that threatens both the Academy and the Federation itself. Yes, Lily. Tawny Newsom, who voices and plays the live-action character Beckett Mariner, also revealed that she's joined the Starfleet Academy writing team. Alex Kurtzman and Noga Landau will serve as co-showrunners and will executive produce the series. The series premiere episode is written by Gaia Violo, who is also an executive producer alongside Rod Roddenberry. So mark up yet another Star Trek series. I know, BK, that you're hoping to see the return of the Starfleet Academy location filmed at Southern California's Los Angeles Tillman Water Reclamation Plant with the Japanese Garden seen in many an episode. Now let's reveal this week's episode top 10 topic. Of course, today we'll focus our attention Bridge on... Bridge to Ambassador Kreutz. You have an incoming transmission from the planet Vulcan. Thank you, Captain. Please route it over to my quarters, subspace channel 47, and do a split screen of Lily Fox Lim. Away team reporting from Mount Salea on the planet Navar. Oh, I see that you've made it to your mission destination safely, Raj. And what do you have to report for us? I'm making a tour of the Catrick Arc for my journalistic endeavors. I'm here to present my findings for our episode today. Our topic should please you, Lily, as it is our countdown of the top 10 best Vulcans on Star Trek. Aha, very pointed idea for a Vulcan top 10 topic. Thank you for checking in, Raj. I'm very interested to hear your report on what you learned. Oh, I absolutely love the Vulcan species and the pure unequivocal logic. I attribute this to you and your love for all things Vulcan, Lily. But indeed, let's get into our top 10 list of the best Vulcan characters on Star Trek. Raj, please take it away. Thank you, Bass. I would first like to mention that here in the Catrick arc, I have access to many of the great minds from the Vulcan culture. And I must say, I was sidetracked very easily with some of the important people who have had influence on the culture despite them not being fully Vulcan. Among them would be Michael Burnham, Amanda Grayson, Perrin, Jonathan Archer, Jean-Luc Picard, and even Tuvix. 
I agree that these are all amazing people, but they don't necessarily fit as true Vulcans. For instance, Amanda Grayson and Perrin were wives of the great ambassador Sarek, the former being the mother of Spock. Now, particularly curbing their own human emotions, often being difficult to suppress. Yes, Michael Burnham had a better advantage of adapting as she was raised as a young girl in the home of Amanda and Sarek, and she had the benefit of Amanda's experience to allow herself to grow in her discipline. She also had a tremendous impact on her brother, Spock, as a young child growing up. You know, I'm fond of the way Rod is honoring Captain Jonathan Archer when he had to embody the Katra of the great Surak, the father of modern Vulcan philosophy. It was through his efforts that saved the Vulcan culture and helped make it what it is today, avoiding what could have been a devastating civil war threatening the very foundation of Vulcan logic by illogical extremists who had a tarnished view of Surak's teachings. Jean-Luc Picard helped retain the dignity of Sarek during his final role of Federation ambassador to the Ligarians, when it was discovered that the highly decorated ambassador was suffering from Bendai syndrome, a mind meld helped stabilize his mind to complete the mission. Later, he was able to transfer memories to Spock from his father. And who could ever forget the lovable Tuvix? A being created by a transporter accident combining Tuvok and Neelix deep in the Delta Quadrant on Voyager. In the end, Captain Janeway made the decision to separate the two. But the memories still live on in both men, as well as the fans of the show. Raj, these are all great characters, but unfortunately they cannot be counted on our list. We need to have real Vulcans. Well, there's always Sadik we could talk about. Not fully Vulcan, but part Romulan. And it is rumored that she carried the baby of Spock. But those claims can be considered headcanon, as they are unfounded in the actual canon of Trek. Uh, much like myself. Yes, Raj. And I don't doubt there is a treasure trove of information there for you to pass off to us. But let's get this list started. You're both correct. I left the area for dishonored Vulcans and was interested that this section existed. But because of this Vulcan's family's connection, I was able to touch a mind that was very calming, but also eerily disconcerting. I felt as if my pain kept on trying to be taken away from me. I even had a vision of waking up on XO3 with my father, Roger Corby, leaning over me. He was telling me that there had been an accident and he created a new body for me and transferred my memory and revs into a positronic brain. Let me guess. You told him that you need your pain, that you didn't need to share it to gain strength. And you'd be absolutely right. Hey, how did you know? Cybok. Number 10 in our top 10 Vulcans, the illegitimate older half-brother of Spock. Born to Sarek from a union with a Vulcan high princess, Cybok became a revolutionary of the Vatash, Katao, believing there was more to life than the strict adherence to logic. They wanted to control their emotions by actually feeling them. Cybok struck out on a quest to find the ultimate paradise, Shakari. Amidst the stars of our own galaxy, we shall seek the answers. Together. Shakari, the source. Heaven. Eden. Call it what you will. The Klingons call it Kuitu. To the Romulans, it's Vortavor. The Andorian word is... Long before the series Enterprise came along, Cybok started to change the way that I felt about the Vulcan race. Cybok returned in the newest Trek adventures in Strange New World's first season episode titled The Serene Squall, when, wouldn't you know it, he took the ship hostage again. Or would that really be for the first time? Eh, semantics, semantics, but there you have it. Cybok starting off our list at number 10. Actually, a little birdie told me you used to have a Cybok action figure unopened from 1989 Star Trek V film, BK. See, Vulcans get respect. You remembered. Lily, you have a sharp mind and a memory like a Vulcan. 
I'm pretty surprised to learn that there was a dishonored soul section inside Mount Salea. Well, naturally, Vulcans prefer to keep things hidden, like in the Great Enterprise episode, The Andorian Incident. But as a cleric told me, it seems only logical to keep the contrast of those less than desirable members of the community for others to learn from. For those who do not learn from the history are doomed to repeat it. What an enlightened culture. That's why I love them so much. Oh, Raj, I envy you on your mission and wish I could be there to experience it myself. Lily, yes, the trip would be better if you had accompanied me on this journey. Our next honoree is probably one of my favorites. I don't understand why she's so low on the list. And it took me such a long time to find her, but based on the dossier I was given prior to this mission, I found Till Lynn also is in the wing of the Ark. Number nine in our top 10 Vulcans is Till Lynn. Tell us a little more about what you found out about Till Lynn and why you feel she's your favorite. Shouldn't that be obvious to you, BK, what show she was on? Oh yeah, that's right, Lower Decks. She's an animated character. Now I get it. Hi, I'm Tindy. Welcome to the Cerritos. We're going to be training together. Greetings. I am Talyn. Is there some place quiet where we can discuss my orientation? First, you got to meet everyone. Guys, this is my new study buddy! They've transferred another promising young officer to join in your training. Yes, Bass. Serving aboard the Vulcan cruiser Shabai in the year 2381. Till Lynn distinguished herself by enhancing many of the ship's sensors and other functions. However, had an odd way of going about it. That is an odd way as far as Vulcans are concerned. She functioned off as much logic as she did her gut feelings and instinct, and she also refused to conform herself to standard unfirming protocol. I can understand why this would cause problems for the rest of her crew. I understand that she's been chastised for her behavior, even ordered into forced meditation because of her behavior being deemed unstable by her superiors. Even though she was a capable officer and her efforts benefited the crew of the Shabai, she was reassigned to a more fitting role on board a Starfleet ship to work alongside humans. I can see why Talyn would have thought that that was a punishment for not being Vulcan enough, but I'm glad and expectant to hopefully see her popping up more often in the Lower Deck series going forward. I'm fascinated to find out what else you've been able to see in the Catrick Arc, Raj. Very fascinating. Within the main cavern of the Ark here, all the prominent figures on Vulcan are statues. Each of these are carved straight out of the cave floor in one piece. The most distinguished of these figures and of Vulcan culture itself is Surak, who is known to be the father of modern Vulcan ideology. Number eight in our top 10 Vulcans is Surak. Aside from an imposter image of Surak in the original series episode, The Savage Curtain, Surak was never really seen in any episode of Star Trek. However, Surak has been mentioned several times. That's right, Lily. And the most notable reference was in the Enterprise mini arc of episodes, The Forge, The Awakening, and Kirshara, where Captain Archer actually housed the Katra of the great Vulcan philosopher Surak. It was during this story arc that we learned much about Surak and the influence he had over Vulcan civilization. For instance, in his original philosophical writings, the modern Vulcan leaders of Archer's time mistook his call for Kolinar, the purging of all emotions, as if they were not to exist at all, when what he really meant was for his fellow man to learn to control his emotions and not let their emotions control them. You know, Lily, sometimes I think it would be nice to be able to experience the ancient Vulcan festival of Rumare. <laughs> BK, it's a good thing this pagan fest was done away with thanks to Surak. Surak had such an impact on Vulcan civilization that he has been honored time and time again. Since his time during the 4th century on Vulcan, he is responsible for the Eidic philosophy. Yes, Surak also spoke of infinite diversity in infinite combinations. He created the disciplines of Kolinar and began the first trek through the Vulcan Forge as a test of endurance and strength. Yes, 
Surak is known far and wide, not just in Vulcan culture, but throughout the entire Federation. A class of starship is named after him. He's revered on the same level as Einstein and Isaac Newton, as referred to by David Marcus. Now, even Spock was quoted as saying that Surak was the greatest of all who ever lived on our planet, the father of all we became. I am Abraham Lincoln, just as I am whom I appear to be. Serac. Who? The greatest of all who ever lived on our planet, Captain. Yes, Surak, and one more final honoring. We add him as number eight in this week's countdown. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log, where we're talking about the top 10 best Vulcans. Now number seven in our top 10 Vulcans. A very pointed idea is another Vulcan historical figure. He's an influential founding father of the Federation itself, Ambassador Pointy. Raj, let's stay away from the derogatory slurs. Pointed ears are a positive trait. Sorry, Bass, it wasn't intentional. I was only quoting the great Captain Archer of the original Starship Enterprise, MX-01. How about since you are the Bass, he can be Bass 2.0? Okay. Sometimes it's best to let things go without repeating them, Raj. Okay. I apologize. Soval was assigned as the attaché from Vulcan to planet Earth and was responsible for keeping Starfleet in line and to keep the humans from expanding too far too quickly. This drew the ire of Captain Archer, who felt that they were needlessly being held back. You spent far too much time with humans. It will be best if you return home for a while. You thought it was crucial to place a Vulcan on Enterprise during its first mission. Why not now? You were there to provide logic to a crew of humans who insisted on leaving before they were ready. Saval at this time had been living on Earth for over 30 years and was a principal consultant on the Warp 5 program under Jonathan Archer's father. His name was Henry. Now, this has caused what the captain felt was unnecessary restrictions and setbacks to that program that ultimately held his father back from seeing the program to fruition before he passed away. Prior to his appointment as ambassador to Earth, Soval served as an intelligence officer in an occupational force at Pan Makar, which ultimately led to his becoming a negotiator for a peace accord between the Andorians and Vulcan. And it was during this time that Commander Shran developed a deep respect for the ambassador. It wasn't until a bombing occurred at the United Earth Embassy on Vulcan, which killed Admiral Forrest and nearly took the life of Saval, that Captain Archer began to form a kind of a friendship with the ambassador and began to trust in his logic and for Saval to trust in Archer's emotional response to solve the mystery of the corrupt Vulcan High Command. And there was also a feud as well. The feud misrepresented the Cyrenite movement. His character was a big departure from how most fans have come to view the Vulcan race. It was an interesting perspective to use Star Trek Enterprise to show us an unexpected side of Vulcan culture, and in effect to give them a villainous aspect within the plans of Starfleet. And it definitely changed my view of them, but not at all in a bad way. It just really intrigued me that there was more depth to these people who I love, who are often perceived as cold and non-feeling. Ambassador Soval was played solely by actor Gary Graham, who just so happened to be one of our special guest interview subjects during our first season of the Captain's Log. That's right, Raj. Gary Graham is a great person and actor for playing Soval. That's what's great about a Captain's Log. You can always go back to rewatch our interviews once in a while and still find something new. Raj, who is next on our list? I've taken a break from the Catrick arc after finding some very interesting information and decided to take a stroll for some on-site inspiration for our next honor. As Captain James T. Kirk so eloquently put it, all a Vulcan in one package. Raj, where are you taking us? Lily, do you not recognize the famous ancestral lands of Mr. Spock's family? This was first seen in the original series episode, A Mock Time. 
Oh yes, this is the spot where Kirk and Spock fought to the death in what was supposed to serve as the venue for a wedding, but turned into a ritual for the Kunat Khalifi battle when Spock was going through Ponfar. Raj, I cannot believe you would attempt to insert Spock into the number six slot of our countdown. Don't you believe he should be in a more deserving position? Our Vulcan is not Spock, but the most revered High Priestess T'Pau! Number six in our top ten Vulcans, and not only was she the presider over the marriage ceremony between Spock and T'Pring, but was very influential in the Seer Anite movement that was briefly mentioned with Ambassador Saval. T'Pau became one of the greatest figures in Vulcan history, being a diplomat, judge, and philosopher. She's appeared in three Star Trek series, the original series, Enterprise, and even made a very brief cameo in the holodeck of Voyager, where we learned that she was absolutely ruthless in the application of her logic. Yeah, that was in the episode Darkling from the third season of Star Trek Voyager. She made only one appearance in a mock time of the original series, and we learned that she was the only one ever to have refused a seat on the Federation Council, although no specific reason was given. But it was from the series Star Trek Enterprise that we learned much about how she became such an integral part of Vulcan culture. There was a very real threat to Vulcan society from the High Command due to political turmoil and misinterpretation of the teachings of Surak. T'Pau was the leader of the Siranite movement after the death of Siren during a sand firestorm in Vulcan Forge. T'Pau was falsely accused of bombing the Earth Embassy. She was later cleared of those charges after an investigation was conducted by Captain Jonathan Archer and she returned him and T'Pol to the High Command with the Kirshara artifact. T'Pol was able to not only prove her innocence and that of the Siranite movement, but prove that mind melds, which were heavily frowned upon, were quite safe and productive and should be practiced by all Vulcans. You don't believe in the Katra? It's irrelevant what I believe. The captain could be permanently injured if we don't get him to a doctor soon. He doesn't need a physician, he needs a priest. One experienced with Kaltras. What an amazing Vulcan, the high priestess who presided over Spock's Kulinar ceremony in 1979 Star Trek The Motion Picture. Now, that could have possibly been to Paul as well. However, this character had no official name in that film. Well, she certainly did have an affinity with Spock's family for sure. And speaking of his family, let's talk a little about Spock's father, Sarek. Yes, Lily, number five in our top 10 Vulcans is the well-respected Sarek. Let's begin his story at the end of the year 2368 on the planet Vulcan. Now, Sarek the Great, suffering from Bendai syndrome, finally succumbed to the disease and passed away peacefully. He was 203 years old. His widow, Perrin, took care of his funeral arrangements and saw to it that his Katra was transferred to the Ark on Mount Silea. His first appearance in Star Trek is in the original series episode, Journey to Babel, where we see the role originated by Mark Leonard and established as Spock's father. Now, because of the popularity of Mr. Spock during the original Star Trek series run, it sparked massive interest in the Vulcan culture and thus calls for more Vulcan characters. And even a history into the Spock's family were demanded by the fans. Had I been watching at that time, I definitely would have been one of those fans clamoring for more Vulcans and Spock's family history as well. The character grew and grew, moving on to the feature films where we saw Sarek in 1984, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, where he mind melded with Admiral James T. Kirk to find out the whereabouts of Spock's Katra and also provoke Kirk into finding his son Spock. And also in 1986, Star Trek IV, Sarek's role as ambassador to the Federation returns, fighting for the exoneration of Admiral James T. Kirk and crew. Don't forget his most important appearance! that in the animated series of the 70s episode yesteryear, when he bequeathed his pet Salat Ijea to his son. Naturally, that would be your favorite, Raj. Also, the Sarek role played by Jonathan Simpson in the 1989 film Star Trek V during the flashback scene from Cybok, showing the birth of Spock and his father's rejection of him. Sarek was also recast in the new iterations of Star Trek by J.J. Abrams with Ben Cross, and again for Discovery with James Frain taking on the role. 
Sarek was born in the year 2165. He has three children, two biological sons, Cybok and Spock, and his foster daughter, Captain Michael Burnham of the USS Discovery. Now, Sarek was married twice to Earth women. Amanda Grayson, Spock's mother who made him a widower due to the Vulcan's long-lived ages, and then he remarried Perrin. In 2256, he was targeted by logic extremists while on a mission to, of peace to the Klingon Empire. You know, BK, of all his accolades and accomplishments, the most important of all was Sarek's role in brokering a peace treaty between the Klingon Empire and the Federation, urging his son Spock to also take part in talks with then-Chancellor Gorgon. This led to Spock volunteering Captain Kirk into escorting the Klingons to the Camp Kittimer conferences. And we all know how that turned out. Target that explosion and fire. Fire! Number four in our top 10 Vulcans, Sarek having a fiance his son to T'Pring, who happens to be our next figure on our top 10 list. What can you tell me about T'Pring, Raj? I'm still here on the ancestral lands of Spock's family. If I were human, I would be out of breath as the air is thin. Where I'm standing is where the marriage ceremony was to take place. However, it was called off by T'Pring's insistence because she found another mate, Stan. She reasoned that life with him would be better as he would be around and not gone for long periods of time serving Starfleet as Spock would be. T'Pring also felt that she wanted to be the one in control of the relationship, which she could not have done with Spock. With Stan, she conceived a child, Terris, who would later become a matriarch at the Temple of Kolinar. I'm bewildered. Where did you come up with that story? BK, you have to keep up with the current events. This was in issues 66 to 68 of DC Volume 2 Star Trek comics. You know, I love everything Vulcan, and when it comes to them, I'm like Landru. It will be absorbed. And you complain about me not being canon? I'll tell you what I thought. T'Pring appears in the new series, Strange New Worlds, where we find she's friends with Captain Pike. So much so they're on a first name basis. When we see her, she's on the hunt for a fugitive from Ankeshtan Ktil, a prison, or rather a Vulcan rehab colony, where T'Pring works as a treatment specialist and administrator for the facility. She was hoping to spend some time with her betrothed, Spock, but once again he snubbed her to focus on his duties. Hashtag relatable, am I right? <laughs> a new ritual we observed was the Vulcan soul-sharing ritual, but the procedure went awry, and they became trapped in each other's bodies for a time. Despite the accident, it did give a bit of an opportunity for them to understand each other just a little bit better. I wonder if it was like this when my father, Roger Corby, transferred my memories into this body on XO3. I doubt it, Raj. If anything, it would have been more of an electronic vision of Faltor Pan. I can go with that! I love Vulcan mysticism! We're entering our top three, and another t name makes the list. The first female Vulcan to play a leading role in a Star Trek series, Jolene Blalock stars as... You mean the captain of the First Federation flagship Viserys had a Vulcan child? That doesn't even need to be dignified with a response. Let's just pretend that didn't happen, okay? Continue, Lily. Stars as... To Paul, first officer of the original Starship Enterprise NX-01, captained by Jonathan Archer. I wonder if it was widely known that while the Enterprise series was in pre-production, the character of T'Pol was originally planned to be T'Pau. However, there were some studio issues regarding the rights and royalties of the character's creator, so a new name was actually given. T'Pol was born in the year 2088, and in typical Vulcan tradition was bonded by her parents to Koss. Before she joined Starfleet, she was a member of the Ministry of Security, as well as the Science Council for the Vulcan High Command, serving on board the ship Salia as Deputy Science Officer. T'Pol took a one-time sabbatical at Pajem, a sacred temple for Vulcans wishing to undergo deep meditation and training. And the purpose for T'Pol's visit was to undergo Falara. Falara is now an all 
obsolete ritual where memories and their related emotions are repressed. This was because of a mission that she was ordered to take on, which resulted in her having to take the life of another, Jocelyn. Not long after T'Pol was transferred to a post on Earth, moving into the Vulcan compound in Sausalito to work as an ambassador. I hear rumors they have some pretty wild parties there at the compound. I wonder if I put my Vulcan ears on, maybe they'd let me in on the fun. Not likely, Raj. You were lucky enough for me to pull some diplomatic strings to allow you access to the planet Vulcan there, also known as Navarre. Now, it was here she met and started working closely with Saval and after the Klingon incident with Klang. Now, this resulted in Earth's first contact with that race. T'Pol was assigned to be Captain Archer's first officer, as you remember, in Star Trek Enterprise. She would retain this role for 10 years, eventually becoming a commissioned Starfleet officer, having resigned her loyalties to the Vulcan High Command. These chromosomes are human. That's correct. They uh, came from his father. That's impossible. Humans and Vulcans have never been able to reproduce. According to Lorian, I discovered... Uh, or rather, I will discover a method of successfully combining human and Vulcan genomes. Who's the father? Commander Tucker. We have reached the penultimate position in our countdown, and it belongs to the Chief Tactical Officer of the NCC-74656. Now, we took a deep dive into the Delta Quadrant mission files of the USS Voyager for our number two Vulcan to get the skinny on Vulcan Slim. Commander Tuvok, who's now Captain Tuvok, seen in Star Trek Picard. Tuvok had a bit of a troubled youth, having difficulty understanding the necessity of what he thought at that age was to be denying emotion. He was sent by his parents to study under a Vulcan master to control and suppress emotions. In the year 2289, at the behest of his parents' wishes, Tuvok attended Starfleet Academy. Upon his graduation in 2293, he was immediately posted to the USS Excelsior under command of Captain Hikaru Sulu. He found this posting to be rather distasteful because of his perception of humans to be overly egocentric. However, pushed through to fulfill what he felt was an obligation to exceed his parents' expectations. Yeah, so to think that he served under the amazing Captain Sulu plus Getting to meet Kirk and Spock, what a tremendous opportunity. Tuvok was on a mission that tried to save Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy from Rurapente and was instrumental in the battle for peace at Kitamur. He learned a valuable lesson that day about loyalty, although it would not sink in until several decades later. After his initial three-year commitment to Starfleet was complete, Tuvok resigned his commission and dedicated himself to undergoing the Kolinar ritual to purge all emotion. This, however, went incomplete as he got caught up in the burning of his blood, known as Ponfar. Forced to abandon this discipline, he took up a wife, Tapel, and fathered four children, one of whom his daughter successfully completed the rites of Kolinar. It took him 50 years after this to realize the wisdom of his parents. Now, having gone through it himself and decided to make a return to Starfleet in 2349 to benefit from what he now realizes as an opportunity to learn from the many different species and cultures that serve as part of the Federation. During his return career, Tuvok was an academy instructor. He made quite an impression on a young Lieutenant Janeway after dressing her down in front of several admirals for improper tactical protocols. And although having a bruised ego, once Janeway ascended to the rank of captain, she knew that the dedication and integrity that Tuvok displayed made him right for her choice as security officer on Voyager, sending him off on a covert intelligence mission to infiltrate the Maquis Rebellion. Janeway's trust in Tuvok regarding her as part of his family runs deep. Janeway was even invited to attend the culmination of Tuvok's daughter, Asil's Kolinar installment ceremony. A few of Tuvok's passions include botany, where he has bred many prize-winning orchid hybrids. He is a proficient musician playing the Vulcan lute, and he quite frequently enjoys the challenges of the game Kalto. Tuvok's mastery comes to life in actor Tim Russ, who portrays him and is our number two Vulcanian. A captain's log returns in a moment. Thank you for joining Raj, Lily, and I here on A Captain's Log. We're talking about the top 10 best Vulcans. Ha! I 
I'm sure he'd clean the floor with you, Raj. Now, Trekkies, it shouldn't be any surprise that our number one slot belongs to none other than the most famous Vulcan who's ever lived. In fact, with so many details about his life, I'm sure that we won't even begin to scratch the surface. But don't worry, what we left out you can find yourself by picking up a copy of his autobiography. I just so happen to have a copy of it here in our quarters, and I highly recommend you give it a read. Yes, indeed, we are talking about none other than the one and only Mr. Spock. Fascinating. The origins of his character go all the way back to the very beginning of Star Trek overall. Gene Roddenberry based his show mostly on the concept of the human condition, and his episodes were to be a commentary on how the human race has evolved itself. Now, he wanted that viewpoint to come across from as unique of a perspective as possible. Hence, his creation of the alien species represented by a character he called Spock. Studio executives were very pensive about the inclusion of this character. And even after screen tests, they wanted to admit the entire concept of Spock. Can you believe it? Fearing the audience would fear him too much as he looked devilishly evil, which is exactly what Roddenberry wanted. Gene Roddenberry wouldn't give in. He tricked the studios and the public with a doctored publicity poster that had the pointed ears airbrushed out for the removal. However, when the show aired, Spock's appearance was unaltered. And kudos to Roddenberry as Spock quickly became the most iconic figure in the franchise, some would argue, including me, more so than William Shatner's Captain Kirk. Spock has had a very distinguished career in Starfleet, having served almost exclusively on board the USS Enterprise. First, he was under the command of Captain Christopher Pike, then under the command of Captain James T. Kirk. After which, Spock became captain of the Enterprise as a training instructor of cadets when Kirk was promoted to the rank of Admiral. Spock helped save the Enterprise from the madman Khan, but at the expense of his own life, he was able to be revived, having his Katra implanted into the unwitting Dr. McCoy. He had to retain his mind afterward using this form of education. After the decommissioning of the Enterprise, Spock became an ambassador for the Federation and was instrumental in both achieving peace with the Klingons in the 23rd century, as well as the Romulans later in the 24th. They were two of the biggest foes to the Federation of their time. Spock's reunification efforts between the Vulcans and the Romulans came to fruition late in the 30th century when they came together to live on the same planet changing its name to Nivar to commemorate the two cultures now living together. During his work with the Romulans, Spock miscalculated the time that the Romulan sun would go supernova, and this resulted in the loss of the entire planet. His attempt to reverse the event with red matter caused a singularity that pulled him into the past and created an alternate reality. Now, we were faced with the scenario of having two Spocks alive in the same time frame. However, it wasn't too long after that the elder Spock, Prime Spock, passed away. But he left his legacy for an alternate Spock to fulfill and a new history to be written to be added to the achievements already accomplished. The legacy and history of Spock will never come to an end. Oh, I have a shuttle I need to catch that takes off in 47 minutes and 16 seconds and I don't want to miss it. Reporting live from Navar. For our captain's log, I'm Raj. Live long and prosper. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, from Lily and I here on a captain's log, peace and long life.